that I would want to point out. Because this thing, and to break it down for the people, every order, in the normal litigations we do with every day, and you say somebody's rights are going to be violated, if somebody is saying I should not be hanged, I was not convicted properly by the High Court, if, my lord, uh, that person is hanged because before he has been heard by the Court of Appeal, clearly it would mean that the, the process of justice had not been completed, yet we have hanged the guy. My lord, in America, they keep on hanging people, many of them terrible criminals, mass killers. But, my lord, you will observe that uh, at the time when we see these televised killings in America, it is always after they have exhausted judicial process so that they are sure that process that are irreversible take place after every legal benefit and protection has been accorded. One of those that is important, my Lord, is captured under Article 27 of the Constitution, the right to protection of law. So that the issue, as long as I'm in court, the matter is not yet over. It might well be possible that uh, we might lose this application, the interim application that is before the court. But we might also win it, and we are likely to win it. So that because, my lord, of that issue, that a person may actually succeed at the other stage, is the reason why you prevent taking irreversible decisions. And my lord, what is the scenario that we are talking here? My Lord, with the scenario here we are talking about here is simple. Immediately after the, assuming the orders were lifted, that's the scenario I want to describe. What is it that is going to happen? My Lord, we would have a scenario where the Chief Justice, whilst these proceedings are pending before the court, would have to preside over the swearing in of Honorable Kindiki. My Lord, is it in order for my Lord friend? To keep speculating about the swearing in of Professor well, Kaliki. The issue of swearing and in is also, and, and he's referred to it three times now. This is the fourth time. My Lord, I believe that's the law. I hear they have been saying they want to And my Lord, will ask you, you I, then. I was to ask my Lord, what is the dispute uh, before you? Is it the impeachment and whether it was lawful? Or is it the nomination of the second interested party because first of all it's both and uh, i would want some protection for me to conclude so that we are all fair they will have their time to respond and i will not interfere with it my lord so that the important scenario that uh, we must seek to avoid is a situation and this is matter it is also a matter both of the constitution and statute law my lord the issue is that if we get ourselves into a situation in which the Honorable, the Chief Justice, might have to preside over the swearing in of Honorable Kindiki while this petition is pending, my Lord, that, to borrow the words of Honorable, my friend, uh, Senior Counsel, would be the greatest absurdity that we can encounter. Why is it an absurdity? Is an absurdity, my lord, for the simple reason that one of the authorities that we have cited is the Assumption of Office Act, where because of the experiences that this, this republic went through in the years 2007, 2008, specific laws had to be made to ensure that not only that it, will this event be a public event. That's number one. But the more important issue from the standpoint of law is this, that before we get there, all legal disputes, contestations over the right to occupy that office would have been resolved. And my Lord, that is the reason precisely why they say after the Supreme Court has confirmed the validity of those two positions, then you do the swearing. My Lord, it would amount to taking us back if that aspect, that rule of civilizations, were to be taken away on account of the setting aside of the conservatory orders that were issued and for very good reasons by your brother, 
judges. I don't know whether there was a sister, but your brother judges. So that, my lord, the issue, as far as we are concerned, that is an absolutely important issue. We go to the next important issue, public interest. My lord, um, public interest has been defined in very many cases that are before you. And my lord, these public interest case issues are just supposed to ensure that uh, in administering justice, the court will do the right thing. Because we actually have a transformative, one of the best constitutions in the world, for the simple reason that we wanted to be a good example across the world as a leading constitutional democracy. And as a leading constitutional democracy, the issues of public interest is placed at the heart of our constitutional order. I go, my lord, to the definition. This is the only long passage that I will be reading. And this is, uh, I gave uh, the, the supplementary authorities earlier. This is in the famous case of uh, Murungaro, Christopher Daradi Murungaro versus Kenya anti-corruption. This I'm um, citing the passage appearing at page seven to eight. My learned uh, senior, Gedu Muigai, will be familiar with this decision. My Lord, from the last paragraph, what did uh, the Court of Appeal say on public interest? I read, it says it said as follows. Lastly, before we leave the matter, Professor Muigai told us that their strongest point on the motion before us is the public interest. We understood him to be saying that the Kenyan public is very impatient with the fact that cases involving corruption or economic crimes hardly go on in the courts because of applications like the one we are dealing with. Our short answer to Professor Mugai is this. We recognize and are all aware of the fact that the public has a legitimate interest in seeing that a crime of whatever nature is detected, prosecuted, and adequately punished. But in our view, the Constitution of the Republic is a reflection of the supreme public interest and its provision must be upheld by the courts, sometimes even to the annoyance of the public. The only institution charged with the duty to interpret the Constitution of the Republic and to enforce those provisions is the High Court, and where it is permissible with an appeal to the Court of Appeal. We have said before and we repeat it, the Kenyan nation has chosen the path of democracy. Our constitution itself talks of what is justifiable in a democratic society. Democracy is often an inefficient and at times a messy system. A dictatorship, on the other hand, might be quite efficient and less messy. In a dictatorship, we could simply round up all those persons we suspect to be involved in corruptions and economic crimes and simply lock them up without much ado. That is not the path Kenya has taken. It has opted for the rule of law, and the rule of law implies due process. The courts must stick to that path, even if the public may, in any particular case, want a contrary thing, and even if those who are mighty and powerful might ignore the court's decisions. Occasionally, those who have been mighty and powerful are the ones who have run to seek the protections of the courts, when the circumstances have changed. The courts must continue to give justice to all and sundry, irrespective of their status or former status. What orders should we make in the motion before us? So then, my Lord, I make three points with regard to what is public interest, as understood by the Court of Appeal. Number one is that public interest means enforcement of the constitutions of Kenya. Secondly, my Lord, to make the point from what we have cited, that the first duty of ensuring that you both protect the constitution of Kenya and you protect public interest is vested in the High Court. Every other court above the High Court, the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, they can only do that on the basis that they are sitting in an appeal on a decision already made by the High Court. So that, my Lord, it will be the submission that this reinforces the huge burden that this court must undertake. And my Lord, the final issue that was being understood here is to say 
a constitutional democracy would not mean anything unless due process is upheld. And due process is the first duty of the High Court to ensure that in whatever dispute that is before the court, before it is decided, the court has confirmed due process has been observed and as a constitutional democracy, that is a standard, because they call, try to compare ourselves with a dictatorship, that as a constitutional democracy, we can live with the decision. As my learned colleague Mr. Ngoya was saying, we cannot possibly believe with a decision in which we would be seeing the Chief Justice, where, if, if that were to be the case, you would be seeing the Chief Justice swearing on Rapokidiki while we are arguing this matter before the court. So that the rules are clear, the rules do not require much elaboration on what they mean. And since that criterion of public interest has been made by the Supreme Court itself, my Lord, I urge you to uphold it in the manner that will best ensure that the constitutions of Kenya and its dignity have been upheld. My Lord, there is uh, the question, so that I believe that we are very clear on public interest, except to emphasize that uh, for the specific specifics of this case, what does the call of public interest require this court to do? It's a simple call, five quick things. Number one, to confirm that the law on impeachment has been properly in interpreted and applied. That's the first issue to confirm that the laws on impeachment has been properly interpreted and applied. Number two is to achieve substantial just, substantive justice for the parties. So that at the, when we a judgment will be issued by this court, at least uh, everybody can win something. That nobody goes home with a hall of victory. That is the whole idea of substantive justice. The third issue is to determine that the issues of the violations of the constitutions uh, is done while the matter is still alive before the court. My Lord, very serious issues on Articles 27, 38, and 50 of the constitutions have been raised. They are all under the Bill of Rights. We urge that while public interest to be, needs to be upheld by ensuring that when this court pronounces itself in a judgment, those issues would not have been turned into academic. Number four, my lord, is uh, to ensure that the integrity of the presidential or political succession that is written in express law under our constitution is not rendered ridiculous or ineffective. And in those, I point out what we had said earlier, the desire of the makers of the constitution was any person who will hold the office of deputy president and therefore can potentially become president without an election ought himself to be an elected official. So that it's a big thing if this office, and without good reason, except political malice, is held by an appointed person. It is, there, it is in public interest that an elected deputy president, except for the clearest of evidence, except for the greatest of sins that are clear to all men of justice, is not removed from office. But the fifth issue is to do this, that this court protects the constitutions. I already told, uh, talked something about it, so I don't have to go much into it. My Lord, I, there, are only, there are only two decisions, before I sit down, that I would like to point myself to. There is the issues of Gedongori versus Attorney General. It is one of the cases that are before you. The facts in Gedongori are notorious, and they are also notorious for the simple reason that that decision, if those old advocates who are there, Kinapol Muite and Dr. Gibson Kamaukuria tells us, they were, that it was largely, though it was a three-judge bench, it was written in the style of Chief Justice Madan. My Lord, that, that issue said something that is important to me, the younger advocates in Kenya. And what it said is this, it emphasized the question of justice. And it emphasized the question of justice that is the simplest meaning in plain English. You need to ensure everybody has a, 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 a fair and square deal. This is to say that at the end of the day, everybody will leave the court and say, probably my advocate was not as good as I thought, but the judge did their best. But at the end of the day, let it be very clear that uh, the court 
did everything that is possible to ensure that uh, justice in its substantive form is achieved. This decision was rendered in 1984, long before the article on 159 was written. And that is why it is celebrated. And my lord, it is also celebrated, and I am mentioning here for that reason, whenever honorable men uh, candidates before the Judicial Service Commission are called upon to name whose jurisprudence has affected them, it is uh, Justice Madan that is mentioned very many times. I will strive to be like Justice Madan. And my Lord, it is for good reason. All of us celebrate Justice Madan because he strived to do justice. But my Lord, in the same case, the older lawyers also told us about Alan Hancock, about Dugdell, and even about Chunga. They tell us all these stories. But my Lord, in those interviews, I do not hear anybody saying I want to be like Alan Hancock. So that my Lord, I cite Madame in order to support the proposition that Judge Madame would never remove the conservatory orders that are before you. Under the principles of doing justice and offering everybody a fair and square deal. The last case that I would want to cite before I hand over to Melanie colleagues, Professor Ogada, has he gone? Oh, <laughs> I thought whether he has disappeared. But before